How long have you been out of school? About four years. And have you worked since you left school? No. While you've been looking for jobs, how's your luck been? Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. Uh, if it was good, I'd be working. What jobs have you been trying for so far? Waiter, waitress. Pick up, carry out. Any luck? No. How many places have you tried? Wendy's. Pizza Hut, Crystals, Popeyes, Sonics, McDonald's. Have you heard back from any of these people? No, I gave up. <laughs> I'm going to go back out. Probably Monday, starting Monday. Start looking again. I'm going to put in the application in all those places again. If it's so difficult to get a job, what do you think of this place at the moment? It stinks. Serious, it stinks. Greenville is a riverside town where blacks and whites have always lived side by side and where the contrasts between rich and poor are some of the most vivid in the United States.
This house belongs to the owners of a plantation. <laughs> the plantation has been in the hands of the same family since the 1870s. The present owners are Jack and Polly Montgomery. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. That was good. Hopefully, I'm glad everybody enjoyed it. Thank you, Gus. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Jack, are you going to South Carolina tomorrow? No, I think I'm going on Thursday. Thursday. Mm -hmm. And I meant to see it this weekend, but they took so long. Jack's main interest on the plantation is cotton. On. He took us on a tour of his 3,700 acres of prime Delta land and some of its facilities. Y'all couldn't have picked a prettier day to ride around. It's beautiful today. Jack has his own private airstrip and airplane. So this is yours? Yeah, this is mine. Do you fly this plane yourself? Yeah, I fly that one myself. Where do you go in it? On oh, business trip, Lane. It's fast, that'll get you there in a hurry. Doesn't your wife get worried? No, she used to worry, but I think she's gotten over it. She used to fly with me, and she's gotten over that, too. In the Mississippi Delta, cotton has always been, and to a great extent still is, a way of life. In many areas, it's the backbone of agriculture holding its own against the introduction of more recent crops, like soybeans and rice. The jobs people do on a cotton plantation depend on race. The vast majority of the land is owned and managed by whites. The bulk of the manual work is done by blacks. It's the mechanical picker, like a huge vacuum cleaner that sucks the cotton off the plant, that has kept cotton in business. It's mechanization, too, that has drastically cut down the number of farm jobs to a fraction of what it used to be. For what his plantation used to be like before the introduction of machinery, Jack Montgomery. The main crops we had when I was growing up, of course, cotton was number one. It was the money crop. What you would see, oh, 40 or 50 people out there picking cotton by hand with what we call cotton sacks. They're long cotton bags that they would harvest by hand and put the cotton in a bag. And it was quite primitive, well, look, looking back on it, but it's the best, the best we had. We didn't have any equipment or anything else. They were being paid so much a pound for picking it. Oh, I can remember I'd add up all the weights that all of them had and uh, pay them off. We always paid off in cash. There no such thing as checks back in those days. Practically all of agriculture was with mules and plows and a tremendous number of uh, black tenants. But all of this land you see here was covered with little tenant houses, little bitty houses. That There's one over there in the distance. See that abandoned tenant house? Well, there were probably one to every 30 or 40 acres on these big farms. How big was your farm in those days? Oh, uh, we were farming about probably close to 3,000 acres at that time. There have been changes in the towns of the Delta, like Greenville, that are just as far-reaching as those in the Delta countryside. In the downtown area, Old Greenville still survives with a traditional look and feel of the Deep South.
Yet now, on the edge of town, everyday America has finally arrived. Most of the economic facts behind this glossy facade are here in Greenville's new industrial parks. Companies have been attracted by cheap land, low taxes and state laws that limit the power of labor unions. This is Greenville's slice of Sunbelt development. Sunbelt meaning southern states like Mississippi that have been making rapid economic progress in the last 10 years or so. One of the largest Sunbelt type investments in Greenville is the Uncle Ben's rice processing plant. The rice is grown locally in the Delta, where it's increasingly taking the place of cotton. With a labor force of only about 140 people, the factory turns out all the packaged rice the company sells on the domestic market. There's extremely stiff competition for jobs like this in a place like Greenville. <laughs> Two Mississippians who got theirs are James Hamilton, a shift coordinator, and Jerry Chadwick, a process operator. Haven't had any more problems since Pickering came back and updated the program back. Jerry and his family live in a trailer park. Trailers are inexpensive to buy, almost like houses inside, and have sprung up all over the Sun Belt as the population has grown. The Hamiltons live in one of Greenville's new black suburbs. Good. Hey, Warner. Good. You dusted all of your words today. Okay, how do you? We ask the Hamiltons about their family background. My father worked as a sharecropper and my mother also at the time which where they raised crops and the person that owned the land would get half or more of whatever they raised so from year to year you ended up not able to make ends meet so you in a you in a rut the rest of your life unless you get out of it the chadwicks are a reminder that some whites too were cotton workers from the time we were small growing up I can remember my grandmother dragging me through the cotton, hill, cotton field as she picked cotton. When I got about 12, I went to Louisiana and I hoed cotton with my grandmother and them down there. So I know a little bit about cotton. <laughs> it's not too much fun. I picked cotton an awful lot. Couldn't get much of it. And I chopped cotton. And you were there for 10 hours a day and you only break for lunch, or if you have to go to the bushes, as they called it. <laughs> but other than that, it's just a steady 10 hours every day, day in, day out. I could make about $2 a day, two and a half, three dollars 
And with an appetite like I had, I'd eat up more than half of that. So the only thing it was doing was really keeping me out of trouble. We lived in a small, kind of like a shotgun house. I remember this very well. Shotgun house? What's that? It's about a three or four room house, just just like a straight line. It's no petitions in between it. Not necessarily, you know, built off to the side. It's just a straight shot. So you could fire a gun right through it. Exactly. <laughs> what happened? My mother uh, made all of our clothes, all of our shirts and everything. And they were always made out of flannel. And I wanted a shirt that I could put starch in, like all other children at school. So, and I didn't get it until I was old enough to start work on my own. And I went to work and I bought me one myself. And I was about 14 before I got the first store-bought shirt. Your first shirt from the store? That my mother didn't make. <laughs> Greenville sees new jobs like these as a way forward from poverty and backwardness. We asked Jerry Chadwick what the job means to him. Uncle Ben's, to me, has been financial stability because they came into Greenville with a better pay scale than most of the other factories around and um, getting a job at Uncle Ben was just more you know of a financial support for you know my family and myself James Hamilton like huge numbers of blacks had to leave Mississippi as a young man and move north to find work <laughs> For him, this job is especially important. I really felt that I'd never be able to come back here and live until I retired, because I never felt that I'd make the money here that I was making there. So me entertaining the idea of coming back to Mississippi just never crossed my mind. And that said, turned out to be the best thing probably could have happened to me. <laughs> so what I'm going through now is a dream come true, I guess, for my whole family. There was never an idea that anyone in the family would go as far. Because from those, I guess, sad beginnings, you never thought about, you never allowed yourself to think that high. Although far less than it was 10 years ago, some of the poverty that makes Mississippi the poorest state in the country still lingers. New jobs in new industries have not yet closed the gap between Mississippi's standard of living and what is average for the nation. Robin King is 19 and lives in a black district of Greenville. No olives, no mushrooms. No, I don't like olives, mushrooms either. Fine. No mushrooms, no olives. Hello. What is it? Robin was doing well at school, but had to leave and look for a job when her grandmother, the only wage earner in their family, fell seriously ill. How long have you been out of school? About four years. And have you worked since you left school? No. While you've been looking for jobs, how's your luck been? Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. Uh, if it was good, I'd be working. What jobs have you been trying for so far? Waiter, waitress. Pick up, carry out. Any luck? No. How many places have you tried? Wendy's, Pizza Hut, Crystals, Popeyes, 
Sonics, McDonald's. Have you heard back from any of these people? No, I gave up. <laughs> I'm gonna go back out. Probably Monday, start Monday. Start looking again. I'm gonna put in the application in all those places again. If it's so difficult to get a job, what do you think of this place at the moment? It stinks. Serious, it stinks. I wanna leave here. I wanna get my education. I'm, I've never been so, so in a hurry to get an education. And I see now how important it is to have an education. It's very important. Because if you don't, you're going you're gonna to be in the ghetto all your life. You know, unless you lucky to find this lucky man, you know, you be lucky and hook up with a millionaire. That's the only way. Then you don't have to worry about nothing. With unemployment still as high as 60% in places, it's worth questioning whether the Delta is getting its fair share of Sunbelt-type development. Charles Bannerman, a successful businessman deeply involved with Greenville social problems. There has been some impact on the state of Mississippi from the Sunbelt phenomena. Um, however, I don't think that most of it is in a place like the Mississippi Delta. Um, the reason being is that the Mississippi Delta is a majority black. Because it's black, it has not seen a great deal of development that the white areas are seeing. In fact, it appears to be avoiding areas that are majority black. And for that reason, I call it the shade in the sun belt. You call it what? The shade in the sun belt. What do you think of the large industries that have set up in the industrial park? How useful are they? Well, uh, these industries are not designed to be, um, uh, to produce a, a lot of jobs. They're designed to produce a lot of profit. The industrial policies to recruit uh, large capital intensive plants will never employ a lot of people. We have problems of labor surplus. And uh, what needs to happen is we need a policy that is designed not to utilize capital, but to utilize that labor. We once had full employment to a degree. I mean, everybody, everybody on a plantation worked. Mother worked, children worked, babies worked. Old people, young people, everyone worked. What we need is to recognize the problem, the problem that we have a huge labor surplus that has been displaced by uh, technology. You've just got literally uh, hundreds of thousands of people who have been displaced. So the mission should be to have programs and policies and public spending designed to employ uh, the surplus of uh, population, which also happens to be the majority of the people. Thank you. 